I want to say that it's good to see everybody. We're glad that you're here, that you took time out of your busy schedule to support this work. I appreciate the brethren here and the hard work they've done in allowing me to be part of this. So far, I've enjoyed everything that the guys have had to say. In fact, is I think what's happened is the, the real good team was already done, and now the game is won, and we're going to put the scrubs in and see if we can't just run the clock out a little bit here. So I am glad to be here, and I'm glad you're... There is one correction that I think needs to be made of, of something that was said uh, from up here in the pulpit, and that was this. Dr. Pepper is not the best soda on the market. And I am, uh, I'm pretty sure that's objective and not, uh, you know, suggestive there. So, I mean, we can discuss that some other time. I'm going to cover a few things and, and, and that, the, uh, that some of the other guys have covered. We step on each other quite a bit here. But I want to cover it from a different standpoint before uh, we get into the talk. I want to tell you what I'm going to try to do with this. I want to give you nuts and bolts about how to sit down and visit with somebody and talk to them about a situation that they're in. I've run into all of these situations and am currently involved in trying to work with a situation uh, where a young fella had felt like that he was transgender. And uh, we've been trying to reach him and work with him. And there are certain things that you're going to have to be able to do and know whenever you go and you work with these people. 1 Timothy 2, 24 says, The servant of the Lord must not strive. It's not on the PowerPoint, so it's a bonus verse for you. But it says he's supposed to be gentle, teaching people, patient. I want to give you some things about that. We teach these people, we, when they come our way. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not a computer guy. You're fixing to find that out. Uh, I'm not a PowerPoint guy. Somebody built this for me, and hopefully I'll be able to muddle through it here. Uh, that's not the way we used to, to do things. But I, I told Mike McCorkle and Dusty Nighty one day, they came over to the house, and it was years ago, and they had this box-looking thing. And I go, what's that? And they go, it's a computer. And I go, a computer? And they go, yeah. And uh, then they said, we got this thing called the Internet. And we can go on and we can advertise about the church and we can reach all kinds of people. And I told them this. I said, you take that toy and you put it away because that is a fad. Nobody's ever going to look at the Internet. Well, I was wrong about that. But folks, if you use the Internet in your work and you reach out to people through the Internet, what kind of people do you think you're going to get? What kind of people are going to respond to your websites? What kind of people are going to respond to the requests that you put out for Bible studies with them? Now, if you do like a lot of us older ones have done and you just go door to door fishing in the pond we have, you're going to meet anything. And they didn't invite you, you knocked on their door. So when we run into these situations, are we going to be able to handle it? I'm going to tell you something. If you run into a situation where you strive, which is what 2 Timothy 2.24 said, don't do. If you get into a fight, if you get into an argument, you get into a battle, you get into a debate, pack up and go home. It's over. That's going to just cause people to draw back into their corner, which they already were in to start with. And that's just going to drive them like a tick on a dog. Now, there's an old saying for you, and you can repeat that one later on if you want to. You don't want that situation. As you keep reading in, in verse 25 there, he says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You know, I was a salesman for years, and I never sold anybody anything. If somebody said, man, you're a good salesman, they never bought. What's the deal with that? But you see, when they bought my product, they saw the value in it. They saw me coming, and they took advantage of me, and they got this great deal. That's what people want. They need to see it for themselves. I want you to know God can forgive any sin. You can't get yourself in a situation God can't get you out of but you're going to have to want to get out of it. Not everybody out there is a prospect. 
I want you to know that right now. You're going to run into people and you're going, to, you're going to do what Jesus did. You're going to have compassion on them because you can say, I could help them, but they really don't want to hear you. That's their choice, folks. That's their choice. God can forgive anything if someone is willing to make a change in their life. Now, let's see if the wheels can come off this meeting. Well, I guess we got it going. I want to talk about alternate lifestyles in the scriptures, and I want to talk about how we're going to approach this and how we are going to approach these people. I want you to know something. We are not bigots. We are not homophobes or any other phobes, whatever a phobe is. We're not any of that stuff. We're scared. I want you to know something. If what you believe as a Christian is right. There is a living God and there is a reward for them that serve him and there's a reward for those that don't. And that's scary. I was about 10 years old and I was sitting in a church. I was not raised in the church of Christ. So I, I will tell you, I was in the denominational world and the preacher that was preaching, our preacher there, he, he's an ex-fireman. I want you to know them guys can tell some stories. And guess what his subject was? <laughs> he preached on hell and he talked about people he'd seen burned to death in vehicles and in houses and all that kind of stuff and how terrible it was. I didn't think he would ever quit talking. I, want, I raced to the front. You know why? Yeah, I was scared. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Our God is something to be feared, folks. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He said it, or whoever wrote Hebrews 10, 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You, sometimes we may have thoughts like, hell is not good enough for him. You wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy. You're not wishing that anybody winds up there. The Savior came, the Savior came to prevent people from going to that place. And that's our job. We're not homophobes. We're not bigots. We're not so narrow mind. You know, if it's just up to me, y'all go do what you want to. I don't care. Just leave me alone. Don't bother me a bit. But Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. And as Christians, it's our job to tell the story. And he put the treasure in earthen vessels. we got to be able to look across the table from these folks and look them in the eye and be able to have an answer and help them in the situation that they're in, whatever that situation is. Are things worse today than ever? Now, I'm not going to read these scriptures to you. Most of them have been read. Uh, and those guys were very sweet to print it out for you so you didn't have to actually, you know, do anything. Other. You're going to go to work if you mess with me. And if you want to know what these scriptures say, do that. Are we worse than any other generation? Is it, are things worse today than they've ever been? Really? Look at these verses. Look at where they're located. They're located in the front of the Bible as well as in the middle and the back. Now, the newest verse that I've got on that PowerPoint is 2,000 years old. Now, let me ask you, man shall not lie with a beast. Why is that in the Bible? Because nobody was doing it. Oh, yeah. There's a reason every one of them verses is in there. Do you know that the Bible teaches us that a man shall not dress like a woman? You've heard that today. Why is that in there? Now, we're talking 4,000 years ago. And you mean 4,000 years ago, guys were dressing like women? You tell me. There's a reason every one of them verses is in there. Being a feminine and an abuser of themselves with mankind, that's in the New Testament. Why is that in there? People have been doing this stuff for years. Now, I'm probably getting in trouble with this one, but I'm going to do it anyway. But during Christmas time, there are spoofs <laughs> on certain Christmas carols. 
You ever heard Walking in a Winter Wonderland? Oh, that's a great song. Some guy brilliantly changed it to Walking Around in Women's Underwear. It's okay to laugh at that because that's probably as good as it's going to get. Why is that? Why would, we, why would we find that amusing? Why would somebody change it? Why would anybody even think like that? Because nobody's ever done it, right? They had these problems. Now, I'm going to tell you, in the Greek community, you had guys, that's where the Pharisees formed, was during the Greek time. And they, they were very immoral, and the, the Pharisees did not take the position the Essenes did. The Essenes were a group that this bunch is so bad, it's worse than it's ever been. And they moved out into the desert and had their own little commune where nobody could corrupt them. Of course, the problem with that is all they did was take sin, put a coat on it, and take it with them. As long as there's people, there's going to be sin. That's why that stuff's in the Bible, folks. But there's a remedy for it and a way to get out of it. Now, the Pharisees, fasten your seatbelts, brethren. They said, you're right, the Greeks are terrible, they're immoral, what they're doing is horrible. Now, after some of the verses the guys have read, what were they doing? <laughs> My goodness. But these guys decided, we're not leaving the people alone. We're going to stand up, we're going to speak where the Scripture speak and be silent where the Scripture is silent. Think I'm making that up? That was called the Pharisees. Now, they did evolve into what was going on in Jesus' day. This is not new. We had Rusty Springer hold us a gospel meeting. He did a great job in Gunner last month. And Rusty made a point that I hadn't thought about or not how to, didn't know how to say it. Guys, we haven't invented new sin. Now, we got a different delivery system. We may have perfected how to do it, but we didn't invent new sin. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. That's the book of Ecclesiastes reference there. This stuff has been going on since apparently there were people on the earth. It's been going on for a long time. And what I'm, the reason I'm telling you this is the people you deal with are no different than people have been for, since time began. We're just people. And we have a variety of issues in our lives. And we have a need of a Savior. And we're going to get down to how to do that. I want to ask you a question. Which is worse? Same-sex marriage or adultery? A man or a woman running around. You see, now, let me give you something. The problem with adultery, somebody can always tell on you. <laughs> now, there's a saying in Washington, D.C., if two people know it, it's public. <laughs> That's the problem with that one. Which is worse in the eyes of God? A man or a woman unfaithful to their mate or same-sex marriage? I'm telling you, they're both the same. They're both the same in the eyes of God. We talked about cohabitating, you know, living together. We talked about that during this series of talks. Which is worse, that? Which is worse, a, a man and a woman living together without being married? Or two guys living together? Now, Brent's a lawyer, so he might say, well, the, the guys together are guilty of two counts, and the other one's only got one count, you know, and they pile on the counts on you. In the eyes of God, sin is sin, folks. And we've got to be able to handle that and talk to them about that. Now, I want to handle this a little bit different. What is normal? What is normal? When you look at the book of Romans, it talks about you leaving the natural use of the woman and the woman leaving the natural use of the man. God will define what is normal for you. Whatever goes with God is normal. Whatever goes against God is not normal. How can you say something? That's a bigoted statement, narrow-minded, right-wing, redneck Christian evangelist. The reason is God created people. God created marriage. God created the relationship. Now, if you create something, wouldn't you be able to say if it's working normally? There's a guy who built a lawnmower. 
He knows when it's running normal. God knows what's normal. Hebrews 13 has been quoted a lot. The marriage bed is undefiled. Marriage is honorable. The bed is undefiled. Years ago, my youngest son went to a doctor and he was getting a physical for football. Now, there's only one thing worse, fellas, than getting a physical. That's watching somebody get a physical. <laughs> it, it was a rough day, I guarantee you that. But after the physical is given, this doctor came to him and, and me. Well, I had to be in there because he's a minor. And this doctor decided he was going to give him some medical advice. He said, you're a football player. Yes, yeah, he is. And he said, the girls are going to like you. Okay, you need to wear protection. Now, I'm not going to go further than that. I may be the only G-rated speaker in this whole, whole deal today, to be honest with you. <laughs> but you need to wear protection. And, they, and I'm just, I guess my, the look on my face, he goes, well, Dad, what do you think? I said, I think he needs to wear a wedding ring. How old-fashioned can you be? I, I can tell you how old-fashioned I am. This QR code thing, I still have a DVD player. I mean, you know, I'm up to date here. I mean, how far backwards can you be? He ought to wear a wedding ring. Make a commitment. Stick to that commitment. Work it out. Because that's what God said. That's what's normal. Now, I know a situation where a fellow was doing the transgender homosexual thing and he met a young lady and they're having a baby together. I was proud of myself because we're making progress. At least we got the genders right, right? Come on, folks. There is one thing God recognizes. That is marriage. It's honorable and it's undefiled, and everything else is not normal. Now, you've seen statistics all through this thing. You can Google this. 82% of those that are in the transgender situation, 82% have contemplated suicide. 82%. Now, we can debate later what causes them to want to do that. 82%. Now, I want to approach this just a little different here. God made them male and female. You know, this seems kind of obvious to me. I want to talk to y'all that are homeschoolers. I want to talk to y'all that are teaching in private schools. I want to talk to y'all that are teaching in public schools. Boys are not girls, and girls are not boys. You need to let boys be boys and girls be girls. Now, I'm not saying let boys be boys mean justify bad habits and uh, sinful activity. There is a set of DVDs that I really like. I know, DVD, whatever. Any rate, these DVDs are called Love and Respect. And if you get a chance to look that up some way and see it, you need to do that. And it talks about, there's a teacher, a lady teacher, and that's an admirable profession. They're playing baseball or kickball or something, and this little boy comes around and runs over this little girl. That teacher grabs him and goes, you say you're sorry. What does the boy do? He ducks his head and he shuffles his feet. Okay? And that teacher grabs him and goes, you look her in the eye. You know what they found? Women like to sit facing each other. That's why Starbucks have little round tables. <laughs> Men like to sit shoulder to shoulder. Now, what this lady teacher didn't understand is this boy was showing submission and sorrow by ducking his head and kicking the ground. But she didn't understand boys. So she wanted to make him like a girl and do it the way a girl would do that. And I'm going to tell you something, those of you that are educators, and you listen to me. When you get to, and you ladies listen, when you get two men and they're standing there looking at each other and their chest is heaving because they're breathing fire 
and they're looking eyeball to eyeball, you better get out of the way. That is not submissive, I'm sorry. That is bring it, cat, and we'll see who can settle this. That's boys, and boys are not going to be girls, and girls are not going to be like boys. Boys don't act like girls, and girls don't act like boys. I come up with two things. The boys don't act like a girl, so we medicate them. Now, my dad went through that with me. I didn't get, well, I guess I did get medicated in a way, now that I think about it. The school called my dad and said, Mr. Cole, your son is hyperactive ADD. My dad said, send him home. He won't be tomorrow. (laughs) And that night, it was a miracle. I was no longer having any of those problems. But I've seen young boys walk around looking like almost zombies because they're drugged, because they're live wires. They don't act like girls. And girls are not being taught to be submissive to a husband, to a father, to an elder, to anybody. Now, I hope Melissa doesn't mind me saying this about her. She was 16, and she came in after church. We were having a meeting, and she came in, and she said, Dad, the Bible says that a wife is supposed to submit to her husband. I said, yes, honey, that's what the Bible says. And she goes, and Dad, I want you to know, I believe the Bible. I go, wow, that's cool. And then she goes, that's why I'm never getting married. I ain't doing that. (laughs) Well, I'm going to tell you this, solve problem. (laughs) Doesn't help. Now, eventually she learned and she did get married and have children and all that. But at 16, that was her solution to it, you know. Okay, how many times are girls taught to be subject to a husband? I'm I'm told that we don't understand those verses properly. How hard is it? Boys are not boys and girls are not girls. And I'm going to tell you something. And I don't mean this in a bad way. But if I'd have known all I had to do was go to an administrator and say, I think I'm a girl. I need to go into their locker room. I would have thought that is peachy keen. I want you to know this, that is the best thing since sliced bread right there. Of course, I'd have had a bunch of boyfriends that would have had something to say about that. I guarantee you that, wouldn't I? Absolutely. Boys are not girls and girls are not boys. One of the unintended consequences of this uh, trans thing is how many girls have been knocked out of a state championship and a chance at a, 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 a scholarship because they're lined up to, to do their race or whatever it is, and all of a sudden this other girl comes up that's 6'3", 245 pounds. Boys are not boys and girls are not girls. Now, this is going to shock you. <laughs> your, church, your, your tax dollars at work, brother. Did you know when women were uh, brought into the, to the army where they were doing different jobs just like the men were doing, They ran into a problem, and you can Google this. They ran into a problem. They found out that women were not built like men. Your tax dollars at work. And the women needed a different kind of uniform than the men did because they were built different. You're kidding. Now, I'm going to tell you something about men and women. God made them male and female. He made them different, but he didn't make, that doesn't mean wrong. God created male and female. That's what he intended, folks, and that is God's plan. Let's don't make our boys act like girls and our girls act like boys. It won't work. It will not work. Now, I'm going to get down to how to reach those that are in this situation. I'm going to give you something here maybe you've thought about, maybe you haven't. I'm going to make a suggestion to you. Jesus sent them out two by two. Do not get in some of these situations by yourself. Have somebody with you. Boys, men, evangelists, elders, you're going to go counsel a young lady that is having a marriage problem and not doing anything sinful, nothing like that, other than 
she's having a problem with a cantankerous husband. Whatever. Do not go alone. In our world today, you don't have to be guilty. All you got to do is be accused. And it can turn your world upside down. Don't go alone. You want every word to be established. You don't want to be in that situation alone. Don't put yourself in that situation alone. The other thing you want to make sure is if you go into a situation where there's been violence, don't go alone. And it's going to be hard to do, but sometimes it might be the best plan to make sure some law enforcement goes with you. That dude you see on Sunday morning may not be that dude you see Saturday night. Don't put yourself in that situation. There's another one that's been talked about on social media. There are people that we have known. Some have left the church and gone into other unscriptural situations. Others are talking about these alternative lifestyles. Don't hit like. Don't hit like. Don't, don't, buy, don't approve of that. Don't be a partaker of other person's sins. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And by saying, I encourage you, you're encouraging them to do it. Why would you do that? Be careful what you do with the social media. Be careful what you put out there. Once it's out there, it's out there, and you can, you can erase it all day long, but it's out there somewhere. And there's somebody sharp enough to get it if they want it. I guarantee you that. If somebody has left the church and left the Lord for a different situation, why would you want to like that? I, that breaks my heart. It makes me feel bad about it. I'm scared for them is what I am on that. Do they seek change? That's where I come in with this deal, not everybody's a prospect, folks. Are they really seeking a change? This young fellow I was telling you about with his, his uh, girlfriend now that they're having a baby, he, is, he, called, he called his dad up. And he was going to toss off God and Christianity and all that, and we'd been visiting and working together on that. And he said, I'm not ready to give up on this Christian thing yet. He's beginning to want to change. Now, remember where I started be gentle and be patient. These people didn't get themselves in this situation overnight. And you may not be able to get them out with a one-hour one Bible study. If you do, give me that study. I want to see it. Because, I mean, that'd be terrific, wouldn't it? You're going to have to be patient. It's going to take time. You're going to have to let them see it for themselves and let them recover themselves from the snare of the devil. Now, I want you to know we quote Jesus a lot. Whenever we say, I came not to call the, uh, it's not the sick that need the physician, but uh, not the whole, but the sick that need the physician. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That's where we stop. That's not what the Bible said, people. Add the last line. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God demands a change. Now, I know I like the song too. I grew up singing all 40 verses of it. That's where I went to church anyway. We sang 40 verses of it. But I've loved it when you guys get up here and preach for 45 minutes on making a change and the song is Just As I Am. <laughs> Think that one through, folks. Just as I am, God wants change, folks. Now, yes, he wants you to come to him as you are, but he wants you to change. He called sinners to repentance. He wants change in your life. You remember the lady taken in the very act of adultery? You can think what you want to of that. But the last thing Jesus told her was, Go thy way and sin no more. Now, here's the deal. Jesus, God, demands change. He demands that. It's not going to happen overnight. We're all a work in progress. It's going to take time. But change is possible. But I'm going to tell you something. Change is hard. If you've done something all your life and then you're asked to change it, it's hard. That's where you as a Christian come in. Stay with them. 
work with them, talk to them, spend time with them, let them know they're not out there by themselves. Give them somebody to talk to, somebody that they can, can rely on, that they can trust. But change is possible. But Jesus demands change. Now, where do we start? Here we go. See if I can hit this. Most of the time when you're visiting with these people, they've jettisoned the Bible. They've jettisoned God and they've jettisoned Christ. They're not buying into that, folks. You cannot live in some of these ways, and I don't care what the genders are and all the particulars, you cannot go against God's Word and still believe in God and believe in the Bible. The first thing you're going to have to be able to do, my brethren, is sit down with them and show them through a variety of sources why do you believe there's a God. If I ask you right now, why do you believe there's a God? Do you have a good answer to that? I was 23 years old, and I think Ty was involved in this work. We were all out at El Paso back then, and I ran, we were going up and down the street like we normally do, and I ran into a lady by the name of Delgado, Mrs. Delgado, and she invited me in, very nice lady, and the first thing I noticed on her wall was she had a degree from Harvard and a degree from Yale. That was her first problem. Uh, then she said to me, I've had every preacher, rabbi, and priest in this town try to convince me there's a God. Nobody can do it. Would you like to give it a try? That told me right there where she was at. I said, I asked her this question. I said, if all these people have talked to you, and all, why are you still talking to me? Why do you care? And here come the bombshell. I have terminal cancer. They've given me less than six months to live. Do you know why I believed in God at that point? Because my daddy said there was a God. And if you ask if they're really a God, you got slapped away from the table. It was a lot healthier to believe in God than not believe in God at our house. So I believed in God because daddy said so. The second reason I have for believing in God is I've always believed in God. Ain't that convincing? You know what I realized? I need to go do some studying. I need to find out why do I believe that there is a God out there. Now, there are some excellent works on that, and you can go and you can get on Google or Amazon or whatever. I guess Amazon does go through them. I don't know. At any rate, go, go find somebody that's got a book. Why do you believe in God? Now, you're all here for some reason. Now, I know this. My youngest granddaughter is here because they drug her here. <laughs> she didn't get a choice. But if you're old enough to make your own choice, why are you here? Do you really believe in this God? Then how in the world can you like something that goes against God on Facebook? Simple question, isn't it? Do you really believe there's a God? I hope so. And I hope you find out why. But you need to have some solid answers. And there are people that can help you with this and show you some good reasons and evidences of why there is a God. Do you really believe in this Christ thing? Do you know that a Jewish fellow told me one time, he said, I'm going to tell you this, Jews would be appalled at the idea of a human sacrifice. We believe that Christ was the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He was a human. That's a human sacrifice, any way you slice it. God suddenly wanted a human sacrifice instead of sheep, goat, bulls. When did that happen? Are we able to tell folks that? Why do I believe in the Bible? Had a fellow that we used to work with a long time ago and he did a lot of good work in the church and stuff but he said why should I believe 66 books because somebody took them crammed them between two black covers that it I want to tell you why I believe this is the Bible because I bought it at Walmart that's where I got this giant print Bible and you know you can't put it in print in Walmart unless it's true 
That, that why I believe in the Bible? Well, Mardell's got mine, but that's a step above Walmart. Why do we believe that this is God's Word? Now, when they don't believe that this is God's Word, that there is a God and there is a Savior, you really don't have any way to teach them real truth. I want you to know that. Now, we've been talking about tolerance and scriptures and all that. There is a big difference between tolerance and acceptance. You need to remember that. But the first thing we've got to do is educate ourselves. Why do I believe in these things? And then when I can sit down with somebody and work with them and show them that, once I get them to the point, yes, I can see that there's a God. Yes, I can see the story of Christ. Yes, I can see the Bible. Now I got something to work with. Until then, it's going to be an uphill climb. Now, this has been covered a little bit. There may be more than one issue. Most of the people that I've run into in these lifestyles, and and not everybody, and, and you can have these issues without being in this lifestyle. Don't get me wrong. There's substance abuse of some kind that's going on. Now, I'm going to give you guys something that, that is a little hard for some people to accept and sometimes hard to say. Sometimes there are certain things that's above our pay grade. There are some things that I can help with, but I'm going to need somebody that knows what they're doing, maybe that's been there, done that, to get some help to help these people with some real steps on how they can get out of the situation that they're in. If you've never been in one of these lifestyles, it's probably going to be hard for you to relate to why does somebody like that. So you may need to find somebody that has recovered and get them to help you with that. And maybe there's some people out there that are professionals at it that can help people get over a substance abuse and things like that. And, get, and then get over these, these lifestyles. The, and so you've got to know what you're talking to. If you go and, somebody, and you go into a situation and somebody is higher than a kite, as we say, don't mess with it. You're not talking to the person, you're talking to the drug. Whatever that drug might be. You have to be able to get to the person and not the drug. The drug doesn't need help. It's doing what it's supposed to do. The person is the one that needs help. And sometimes we're going to have to get some people that know what they're doing to help us. One thing that really helped this fellow that we've been working with lately, he uh, was raised in the Northwest and around uh, his mom and sisters and all that, and that's kind of what he knew. And, of course, up there they they really glorify that that lifestyle. And then he moved to the Texas area and now in the Oklahoma Uh, area one of the things that he did accidentally that's where he met this young lady but one of the things that he did accidentally is he changed faces and places he got away from that influence that was on him he got around a different influence he got around his dad who believes in the bible and his dad been working with him loves him very much a lot of times i want to give you this warning Sometimes when you deal with these lifestyles, the first ones you deal with are family members. And that's tough. That's hard. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communications corrupt good manners. The modern versions say evil companions corrupt good morals. Folks, you can't go to the same old place and hang out with the same old crowd and expect a different result. The first thing that somebody's got to be willing to do is change faces and places. And that will help as much as anything. And then as you look at this faces and places thing, many times there's been an abuse in the past that you may or may not know about. That they may be or may not be willing to talk about. When you need to find out what is driving this bus... Why would somebody want to do this? And it may be something that happened to them in their childhood or their early adult life or something like that. 
and, and there was an abusive situation that they were involved in. But you've got to get them to change faces and places. That is paramount. I want to ask you another question here. And this is to the church. Who is welcome at your congregation? Oh, you think, oh, I know the scripturally correct answer. Anybody's acceptable. Elders in the church have had to deal with this forever. In the story of the prodigal son, and you can read that for yourself later, in the story of the prodigal son, you have the prodigal which went to the hog pen. And he needed to make a change in his life. And he came to himself and he went back to the father's house and the father welcomed him with open arms, put the robe on him, the ring, shoes on his feet, killed the fatted calf. You know what I'm talking about. There was another person in this story. That was this kid's older brother. And I always wondered, did the older brother get so upset because he'd done been halved and now he feels like he's fixing to get quartered. But that's a different sermon for a different time. And he talked to the father very harshly. I've been here all the time. I've never done any of that stuff. And you never even so much as gave me a goat, let alone a calf. Our, my brother went and wasted his substance, your money, probably mine now, your money, and first thing you do is treat him like he's a king. Elders have had to deal with this for years. We've got the prodigal. We've got the one that's had the problem that needs to repent and come home. And then we've got the one that never left. Now, we're blessed at Gunner. We're very blessed. We have a very loud chorus that gets going on Sundays. Last count, <clears throat> we had to do a breakdown for the building we're going to be building. We have 50 children from 10 years old to newborn. Now, you have got children. Some of them very young, 10 years to newborns, pretty young. And you come into the church and there's a man sitting there and it's obvious he's a man in a woman's dress. Full makeup, earrings, the whole bit. How do you feel about going to church there? I'm going to tell you something. Y'all may sit there and go, oh, well, anybody's welcome. I mean, that's easy to say, but you're going to have to go home. And your kid's walking by staring at them. And some of these kids don't have much of a filter. <laughs> Look, Mommy, that's weird. You know it's going to be said. I'm going to tell you something. You can empty a church building with that stuff. I think this person ought to be able to go to church. We're just not comfortable going with him. Think I'm kidding you? Who is welcome? How will you react if that situation happens at the congregation you're attending? Are the elders going to have a double headache? What are we going to do? Now, in the story of the 90 and 9, which I don't believe applies to some of this stuff, but we'll get into that later. But in the story that I do want to make a point with the 90 and 9, we got 100 sheep. One of them went astray. Cool. Now remember, God's going to judge the world. We make judgments about those that are within. Okay? I want, the world's going to be the world. Okay? But in the church, we can make those kind of judgments. You're an elder in the church. Some of you already are. Some of you contemplate being an elder in the church. That one goes astray. You go get it. What's your obligation to the 90 and 9? You owe them anything? Just leave them to themselves? What's our obligation? How do we balance this between those that are within and trying to reach those that are without? What's our obligation to the congregation? It'll be a very uncomfortable situation, I assure you of that. It will be. But what are you going to do? As a Christian person with small children or a grandparent with small grandchildren, that even hits harder. What are you going to do? Well, he's welcome to come to church here, but I just think we should go somewhere else more, where we're more comfortable. What are you going to do? Who is welcome? And do we really believe that the blood of Christ 
can take away all sin? Or is that just something that's scripturally correct that we say? It's different when you're actually faced with it. Finally, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord's the answer, and he's given us the answer how to handle these things, folks. We're going to have to educate ourselves some. We're going to have to learn how to talk to some of these folks. And not just that, but anybody with any kind of an issue that's going on in their life. Now, when does the church get involved in this stuff? I want to get, leave you with this thought. Every time somebody commits a sin, the church don't go running and getting involved. Now you're meddling instead of helping. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual or spiritual minded, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians 6 and 1, another bonus verse for you because I forgot to put it on the PowerPoint, but that's the way life goes. Uh, overtaken in a fault, the church gets involved. Not your everyday, okay, I had a bad day, I said some things I shouldn't have, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to do better tomorrow. That's a different animal. But if somebody's overtaken, that's when you get involved. Jesus said, come unto me. If we can get them to Jesus, and they'll come to him, he can fix it. But he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He expects change. My yoke is easy, but it's a yoke. My burden is light, but it's still a burden. God wants us to make changes in our life. God wants us to serve him. If we have the opportunity to sit across a table from somebody... We need to be able to figure out and know how to talk to these people in a way that would make them want to know more about Jesus and come to him because he is the answer. Thank you.